Stacklands is an awesome card-based town building roguelite that I bought for $5, played for 4 hours straight, beat the game in its entirety, and will probably never play again. This isn't a bad thing by any means, I had a great time and fully happy with the purchase and would suggest it to someone who likes the sound of the premise. So before we go through and analyse the various aspects of the game, let's quickly go through what the actual gameplay is. Popping open Stacklands, you'll be introduced to this board, which is where the whole game is set. The game will prompt you to open your starter pack, which will give you some of the basic items in the game. There's stone and wood which are predictably needed to build more extravagant items like lumber camps, markets and quarries. There's a villager which is used to do all the stuff you'd expect them to do, such as working rocks to get stones or being put in a stack with wood and stone to make a house. If you've played any city builder like Banished or Settlement Survival then these concepts are incredibly familiar. This time it's just with cards and you can stack them. There's also food which works slightly uniquely in that Stuckland works on a day cycle and at the end of every Every day your villagers need to eat food. If you don't have enough food, they die, which also makes the game kind of survivally, but barely. A lot of popular YouTube videos on this game really lean on the survival aspect, going as far as calling Stacklands a card survival game, but it's not really, it's a card town builder where you can also die. Then there's coins. Coins are used to buy packs, which at the start gives you many of the basic items I listed earlier, but as you reach different benchmarks throughout your campaign, you unlock new, more expensive packs which provide both different items but also new ideas. Ideas are more or less a tech tree, where they'll tell you what combo of items in a stack can be put together to make new items. Although some items, maybe all, I'm not sure and I don't think so, but maybe all items don't require you to unlock the idea before you can make the item. So if you guess or get lucky or experiment, you can make items before you technically unlock them. And once you unlock them once, when you die in future runs, they'll still be unlocked for you. Which is really nice and an example of some of the roguelite elements that you'll see throughout the game. But focusing on the ideas, many of these unlock buildings. These buildings either allow you to get access to new elements of the game, expedite or even automate procedures, or give you a consistent way to access certain resources. So why would you need a consistent way to access a resource? Well, because the pack opening of Stackland has this aforementioned roguelite elements in it in that it will give you a random collection of cards. Each pack contains a select list of possible items it'll spew out and you'll be either given stuff you really want or need or just a bunch of other stuff. And that's basically the game. You build up a town using card mechanics and there is a quest line but it's basically the goal of all town builders build a really good town. With the gameplay laid out, let's actually analyze Stackland and what makes it really good and the few areas where it stumbles just a little bit. Let's start out with something I love and think is awesome. The game has two separate systems which you need to overcome to avoid getting a game over. The first is food. Every additional person you create requires two food every night. This isn't particularly hard to achieve, but it certainly discourages you from rampantly plopping out babies willy nilly. And this can be a legitimate threat as I had two separate games where I died because I ran out of food. Obvious and easy way to avoid this from affecting you is to just not really have that many villagers. This goes against your natural tendency to want to grow your town as much as you can, but the game institutes something else to make this more difficult. Stacklands incredibly intelligently has a second mechanic to watch out for, the strange portals. Periodically throughout the game, a strange portal will spawn and spew out progressively more and more dangerous enemies. The best way to counter these are with multiple villagers, as the game has an automatic turn-based combat system where the team with the higher number of people usually always wins. This is great, there's a punishment for having too many villagers and there's a punishment for having too few. This means you'll need to continually progress or you'll be left behind while also inhibiting your ability to just sprawl out and grow incredibly fast. So with this what you'll want to do is try stride ahead to get on top of everything. However, once again the game is really smart because there is a limit to how many cards you can have at one time. At the end of every Every day, if you're over the card limit, you'll need to sell a bunch of cards to get under it. So this means you can't really stockpile items or just get a massive stash in the early game that you can sit on indefinitely. And for every building you create or extra villager you get, you're going to have less space for keeping valuable resources you need, such as food. So there's a constant balancing act with how you can grow and what you should be prioritizing when you do grow. I should say you can increase your card capacity and you will definitely want to, but this means you're choosing between a higher card capacity and 
say, unlocking a new building. All this means that the game is actually pretty stressful and can mean things can fall apart at any time. I almost had my whole city collapse about two hours in and was manically selling many of my items just to buy food so all my villagers wouldn't die. I love this because it means there was some pressure the whole time I was playing and I wasn't just cruising through the game. But if you do want to cruise through the game and just have a fun time with it, then there are some options in the menu to facilitate that playstyle. Now, one thing that can make this a little frustrating is the randomized packets. There were a couple different times where I got quite unlucky with the cards and it was just sort of boring or discouraging even. In one playthrough, I didn't get a second villager for so long, which meant my progress was massively slow. I ended up just opening a pack, hoping for a villager, not getting one, then working the items in the pack to make the money back, then repeating the process, hoping I'd get one next time. And that's fine, that's the way the cookie crumbles, but when this happens a couple times in a row, you really start to recognize like, Oh damn, I got unlucky and now all the work I did was for nothing, if not actively inhibiting. And you just grind for more coins, very aware that the game was just wasting your time. Now these moments were few and far between and I think the randomizer is a great addition, but there were times where you'd be fully aware that you had just wasted three to five minutes of your life for literally no positive return. And five minutes isn't a long time, but in a game I fully completed in four hours, it certainly feels long enough. Okay, back to things I like about this game because I do really like this game and I wanna make sure it gets proper praise. So one thing I do really like about this game is the art and sound design. Together they create a really beautiful atmosphere to play in while also providing really satisfying and at times visceral feelings for the cards. This is amazing because the game does have a wobbly bubbly almost ethereal energy to it while also being opposingly firm and specific. One expression of this duality is the way the cards are set in place wherever you put them but can be bumped around by animals that jump or can be pushed by new cards that are plopped out by worked resources. I'm a big fan of this because so many card games have very mechanical and even magnetic cards. They stick to the place they were put and move in predictable and predetermined paths. This works great in games like Hearthstone, but it wouldn't fit here at all. However, this choice, which is great for creating the correct tone for the game, is also the stimulator for my main criticism. The cards are constantly moving all the time, especially once you have a really productive and semi-automated city in the mix. So sometimes when your villager works a card, the product that pops out of it can immediately connect to a stack of the same items if it's nearby. So if you work an apple tree and an apple pops out, then it'll automatically join an apple stack next to it. Awesome, right? That's the sort of production line stuff you'd want in a game like this. Except this is nearly impossible to actually institute in any long-term capacity. Because say a stick pops out from that apple tree, which can happen, then it might push the apple stack away and next time an apple pops out the stack is too far away and now you have a cluster of messy cards. For so much of this game I tried to create systems which could be semi-automated. I tried to design sections of the board to house different processes or resources. This is the wood section, this is the food production section, this is the section where my villagers explore various terrains, a mechanic I haven't mentioned at all but is really cool. Either way I tried to organize the cards and stacks but no systems lost long. I was constantly reorganizing and moving everything on the board, often being just small little finicky adjustments that were more a chore than anything. In this sense, Stacklands becomes a management game. But you're not managing your production line or the direction of your city, you're managing small singular resources. Most town builders have you focusing on managing the macro elements of the town, but Stacklands has you focus mostly on the micro, the minutia, the individual cards. This is genuinely okay and even enjoyable throughout most of the game, and not some massively off-putting part of the experience. Where this is a drawback is the end game. Instead of feeling super accomplished and satisfied with my city that was running really successfully, I felt overwhelmed mostly. And the actual board was much more of a mess than I wanted and visually I wasn't very proud of what I made. I never thought, hey, look at this cool city I created. It was more like, fuck, that's a lot of cards. I think there's a simple fix for this. There's an item called the coin chest. This lets you put coin stacks into a single card essential for managing the board. Like without it, this game would be kind of fucked. If there was a similar item that would work for food and wood and stone, this would really help mid and late game towns become less of a clusterfuck. Where sometimes you have 15 stone on the board in five separate stacks and it's way too much to deal with. Like I said, this isn't crazy terrible or anything and I really enjoyed the game. There were just these few moments where I recognized that something wasn't optimal. Even in those cases though, like the randomized packs or the bouncing cards, these designed choices 
characters improve the game overall and in other ways are really good. This is ultimately a game I would definitely suggest people play. I really enjoyed it and even though I'm unlikely to play it again, I'm also fully aware there are mechanics which can be messed around with and dive deeper into if I was really captured by the game and wanted to get more from it. However, on the other side, in a much less significant way, but there are certain things which I recognized as not being great. None of these really bothered me too much, but I could see them genuinely annoying someone else. And that's the video. If you sometimes feel like a card stacked on top of another card ready to be turned into a different card, then subscribe to the channel and check out some of my other videos. And as always, I will see you in the next one. Bye.